Okay, uh, good afternoon everybody and uh, welcome to Grand Rounds today. Um, we are starting a series of lectures today um, on the topic of research at KCASH and uh, as we start the topic, I will spend a few minutes uh, introducing the topic of research at KCASH. Um, for those of you who um, don't know uh, uh, much about the research department, I think it would be good for you guys to go and visit our website, uh, which is at the main hospital website, and you, you can get a lot of information about uh, what's happening in the research department, what are the uh, protocols that are currently active, and also uh, get you lots of information about projects, submission, news, etc. So I'd encourage all of you to visit that site. So uh, one of the things that uh, I like to start off a lecture at KKSH uh, related to research is that really research is part of the KKSH mission statement. So if you look at the mission statement of KKSH, what we are all about as an organization, uh, you, you, you will see that, uh, uh, of course, our primary objective is to provide uh, tertiary eye care, uh, educate and train uh, uh, professionals, but also to conduct research in the etiology, pathogenesis, and treatment of eye disorders, particularly those at the, that are indigenous to the region. And so this, again, uh, is prime focus for us at the research department that our research efforts are uh, directed towards this goal, uh, which is part of our mission. So we always ask ourselves the question, why do we do research? And everybody has their own reason for doing research, of course. Um, Physicians, uh, prof healthcare professionals, you guys are smart. Uh, you're curious by nature, and I think uh, that is one uh, important reason uh, why you do research. Uh, for m many of us, it's uh, important for academic career advancement, uh, whether you're in the U.S. or elsewhere. Uh, research is how discoveries are made, uh, how the, especially in ophthalmology, you look at all the technology. There's uh, behind that is always the basis of research. Um, it, of course, has benefits to society in many ways, not just ophthalmic research or medical research, but research in many fields and uh, is important, and that's why we have these computers here, these laser pointers that we're using. Uh, these all come out of efforts of research dollars that have been spent uh, globally. Uh, ultimately, uh, research takes a nice big loop, coming back to our first mission statement that it really helps doctors make better decisions for their patients, new decisions, better decisions, uh, and that's how you, uh, research is important. Uh, research is important uh, not only, uh, you know, what is done maybe in Europe or in the U.S. or in England or uh, the, the more uh, so-called developed nations. Uh, research is important locally because very often the solutions for local is issues are really local. And I think all of us have seen that, whether you're in the glaucoma service or the retina service, that uh, the what's in your textbooks may not always be applicable to local conditions, and uh, you really have to innovate, uh, research it, and come up with solutions uh, uh, locally. Now, components of research, uh, at least the, uh, the types of research we do here at KCASH, a lot of that is done clinically. Um, there's a basic science component, which will be described uh, at, at a later talk during this uh, research lecture series, and of course there's translational, somewhere in between, this is what we want to emphasize more and more, where you go from the bench side, uh, and uh, from the bench where you look at things in the laboratory and eventually bring it to the bedside. So one classic example of that kind of research is stem cell transplant on the surface of the eye, hopefully we'll start that very soon. Uh, here the labs are being developed, uh, and that was a classic example where people learned how to culture cells, and now you can treat a ho horrible corneal disease which, can, which uh, could not be treated uh, well before. Now, what are the components of uh, any research? It obviously starts with an idea, and the idea can be a thought, an observation, a discussion. Typically, sometimes you're sitting in the grand rounds and say, well, d uh, Dr. X has presented such and such finding. Maybe there's something else to it. Maybe there's another way to do this. Or you're in the clinic observing a patient and say, well, Maybe this is uh, something different and we really need to look into it. Or a journal club or a discussion during a CTR. Uh, those, are, those are great places where ideas come for research. And of course, uh, it might, uh, if you have that eureka moment uh, when you're sleeping at night and wakes you up at night and you think about something that's interesting, 
those happen rarely, but they do happen. So once you have an idea, you really need to formulate it into a question or a hypothesis, and that's very helpful uh, to direct your research. You develop a research plan. Uh, of course, you, uh, you're going to develop a, re a, pr a proposal that will get approved for its uh, ethics, and Dr. Oliva is going to speak on that later today. You collect data, analyze data, formulate conclusions, and of course, write a paper or a thesis based on where your findings. Now, the key uh, uh, issue in research, and we try to emphasize uh, it to those who come here to uh, and, and spend time in re the research department is to formulate your research question, and that's the key. What exactly will your question address? And once you formulate that question, it's really important that you stick to that research question when collecting and analyzing data and formulating conclusions. It's easy to get distracted while you're collecting voluminous data, especially in a large project, but you really need to stick to the original question which you uh, decided to conduct the research on. And you'll find that when we talk about challenges of research at KKESH, that's one of the challenges we face in the research department when we get data, that uh, there is some degree of uh, um, uh, exploration of data for which really the project was not designed to do. You really need to be able to measure things, especially whether it's a retrospective project or a prospective project. I uh, measure them as a primary outcome measure. In ophthalmology, we're very fortunate. We have good outcome measures. We have IOP, we have visual fields, we have visual acuity. Uh, we have lots of different ways to measure uh, outcomes of uh, things that we do in ophthalmology. And of course, then you decide what are your secondary outcome measures. Primary outcome measures, as you'll, as you'll hear from many of the others who are going to talk, uh, will, will, will determine your sample size for a particular study. So here are some examples of a hypothesis. So for example, on a clinical side, if you, you might notice that, you know, uh, talking in CTR, that viral infections, and of course this is all hypo hypothetical, okay, not enough, this was just made up, uh, that viral in <coughs> infections uh, are more severe in children with allergies. So in order to do such a study, you probably need to hypothesize that really this, uh, that viral infections are more severe in children with allergies, and then you would design a prospective observational study, and then you would look at uh, uh, potentially uh, children over one year with and without allergies and record the severity of viral infection. So this is just a sort of a, uh, a, a broad example. A basic researcher might ask you a different question on the same subject, and the question might be, why is this happening? And he, uh, that the researcher might hypothesize that protein X is produced or the signaling of that protein is defective in, pre in the presence of address the issue of uh, ethics in research and uh, uh, IRB approval. Uh, Dr. Manuel will be addressing that. And of course, I encourage all of you to take the city course. It's not mandatory for many of us. Uh, for those who uh, participate at uh, projects with Hopkins, it's mandatory. But I think uh, it's really a nice ethics course to take online. And if you, any of you that desire uh, to do that, uh, you can uh, contact uh, Abdul Rahman in, uh, in, our, uh, in research, and the, uh, he'll help you get you signed on and get that uh, ethics certification. So some of the pearls to uh, 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 share with you at the beginning of, uh, especially for the fellows, this goes for the fellows, and I think I've uh, uh, told you this before, you start early. Uh, start th ch and choose something simple. Be honest while you're collecting data. Uh, communicate, ask for help when you run into trouble. Uh, no one's perfect. Uh, we all ask for help. Um, and of course, manage your time uh, wisely because time flies uh, really fast when you're busy as a fellow and you're overwhelmed with learning different things. And this is, again, a, an important component of your training here at KKISH. And of course, persist and don't give up. That's the uh, motto in research. Uh, you will succeed if you have a good plan to do research. So over the course of uh, the next uh, four weeks, uh, we will we'll, we'll sort of uh, delve into different areas of research. Today we'll have uh, uh, Abdul Rahman Hamadi, who is our clinical research manager, uh, present uh, organization of research department at KKESH. Uh, uh, Dr. Sheikh will uh, cover IRB uh, uh, basics of clinical research, and then Dr. Oliver will uh, talk about IRB issues, and then followed by that we'll get into different components of research on the 21st, and then we'll talk about genetics and translation research, and some of the challenges of conducting a study at KKESH. 
I just sent out a survey to all of uh, the fellows, uh, I think about half an hour ago. Uh, please, um, uh, you know, take some time. It takes you less than two minutes to do that survey. Uh, please uh, click on that survey monkey tool and uh, provide us feedback. Uh, and then lastly, we will uh, 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 pr uh, spend some time on pearls on how to write a paper, how to submit a paper for publication, and then the criteria for acceptance uh, of a paper. So having said that, uh, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, uh, Abdurrahman Hamadi, who's going to speak to us on organization of research in the research department. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. And welcome in our uh, second uh, research course. In the coming 10 minutes, uh, I will uh, introduce the department, the research department team to you, and we'll also talk about the activities that we do in research department in order to help you to protect your project. This is the organizational uh, chart of the research department. We have uh, Dr. Deepak, Director of Research, who is a member of Glaucoma and uh, Johns Hopkins faculty. Uh, then we have the uh, admin assistant. We have uh, Reem and Fatima. They are responsible about uh, processing your uh, uh, papers and approvals, submissions. We have uh, the uh, research lab. We have Dr. Rajiv, he is the uh, chief of uh, ophthalmic epidemiology. We have Dr. Manu Oliva, the IRB manager, and uh, Nasira Asghar, she is the biostatistician. In the clinical research uh, section, we have three uh, clinical research coordinators, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Mohammed Sheikh, Dr. Iftikhar, and uh, Chess. We have also five uh, research assistant, uh, Faisal Hamidi, Gaddah uh, Al-Ghamdi, Abdul Wahab Al-Dib, uh, Tara Al-Harbi, and Reem al -Ajim. We have also our uh, research uh, uh, registrar, Babar Zaman. Uh, when you when you start your project, you have to contact some persons in, in uh, research department. Some of them before you get the approval in the preparation, preparation uh, period. Uh, Dr. Rajiv, he can help you in the study design methodology, and he can give you he can give you a general advices. Dr. Rajiv extension is one one three one. You can contact me when you need to know how many cases for your project is at the uh, KKH. I can connect you with coding or with other uh, departments. You also maybe need to contact Nasira. Nasira will help you on the sample size calculation and will do also the uh, data sheet uh, design. She can be contacted on 1137. Rimul Khudair, she will help you in submission your project and giving you the approval. After the approval, you need to contact me also to have you assigned to one of the research coordinators or research assistant. And you need to contact the clinical research coordinators. So please do not start your project without clinical research coordinator. Uh, research, research clinical coordinator or research assistant will help you in a lot of activi activities during your study. And also you need to contact Nasira after the approval for data analysis. We have two kinds of uh, projects here, it's prospective and retrospective. We will start with the uh, prospective studies. What we uh, can help you in the prospective study, first is identifying the study subject, and we do that through the uh, coding system, and we can do it also through OR system or uh, iBank database. And we can do also in the prospective study the coordination with OBS or other uh, departments if needed. Some project will need, for example, ultrasound or photography department. So this uh, is our mission to coordinate with them. Scheduling the study subject. Some project needs uh, to open clinic. We can open clinic for you. We can screen the patients, prepare them. And uh, uh, also we call the patients for you. 
consenting the patient. We do the consenting the, uh, consent the patient, but if you choose to consent the patient, you need to make sure that uh, it's valid consent with the uh, valid date. You need to have a date of the consent uh, of patient consenting. You need to have a medical record number. And it's always rec uh, recommended that you call uh, your clinical research coordinator to help you with the consent form. Uh, the, uh, we help you also in creating the database and data entry and data analysis. And the retrospective studies, uh, the research assistant or research coordinator will help you in finalizing the data sheet and coding the data sheet. It's very important not to start your project unless you have final data sheet coded because this will make your collection easier and will make also the data entry easier for us and the data analysis. We, we can help you also with medical records. We uh, request the files for you. And uh, now I think you cannot have access to medical records without a research department. So you have to come through your research assistant or research coordinator in order to get your files. And they give you two weeks to review the files. After two weeks, they will refile the, the files again. Also, the clinical research coordinator or research assistant uh, can uh, help you in data entry and data cleaning. And then we will send it to a biostatistician for the data analysis. This is, this is the uh, IRB CAFA page form. In this form, you need to fill it carefully. Of course, you need to choose the uh, uh, type of project. Is it prospective or retrospective? And you need to put your signature. Uh, there is a, uh, a space for human subject certificate, yes or no. This is the uh, CIT course that Dr. Dibak talked about. And uh, I can help you later. Uh, to get the course and to register. In the end of the, the form, there is a number of the subject. This number, you, you can find it after you meet uh, the Mr. Nasira or Ms. Nasira. She can do the uh, calculation, and then you can go, uh, put, it, put it in the uh, form. When you uh, when we give you when you give you the uh, approval, it's one year approval, and you have to report or write a progress report after one year. You will be reminded by our secretary, and if you do not if you do not send your uh, report, you will not uh, be allowed to to continue in your study. We have monthly report that all the research assistant and research coordinators report the project that they have. So if you have no activity for one month, you might be contacted to know the reason and if there is any problem to help. All research are monitored by research assistant and clinical research coordinators and all deviation are reported to the IRB. Uh, the CIT course is uh, about three to four hours course. It's online course and the passing score is 80 and uh, I'll give you my uh, contact so I can help you on the, on the registration. Those are some contact numbers. Dr. Dibak, 1362. Dr. Rajiv, 1131. Dr. Manuel, 3902. Nasira, 1137. Research Lab, 1082. Clinical Research, 3737. Uh, one last word, it's very important that when you finish to return all the data sheet to your clinical research coordinators. Thank you. Okay, so this talk is actually intended for research fellows who have just joined uh, this year. Um, 
and this is to teach them about the basics of research and for those who are interested to learn about research uh, and to refresh their memory. So for those of you who have seen me running around, I'm Dr. Muhammad Sheikh. Uh, I am at the research department. Okay. Now this is the, uh, just a scheme about the uh, type of studies uh, that you may come across. So there are some type of studies which are analytic studies. So they actually uh, are involved, uh, they actually give out uh, analysis. So those are called analytic studies. So in those studies, what we do is we examine the etiology and causal association uh, about a certain whatever our hypothesis is. So there, there are two type of analytic studies, experimental and observational. Experimental are those studies which are one or more factors altered and effects examined. So we actually look for outcomes. Observational studies are, are made without any intervention. So there are no treatment given and we just see for the observation, uh, see the effect. Uh, these are uh, like some, uh, you can check for the diagnosis. Now. So the experimental studies are two types, controlled trial and uncontrolled trials. Uncontrolled trials are trials without a control group for comparison. And the controlled trials are those with a comparative group. <coughs> Excuse me. Observational studies, on the other hand, are uh, three types, cohort study, case control study, and cross-sectional studies. Control trials can be further divided into two, non-randomized and randomized. So non-randomized are studies where subjects are allocated to an intervention or control group but without randomization methods. So they are just, everybody will receive whatever treatment is available and whatever, uh, whatever groups are in the study. On the other hand, randomized control trials are subjects allocated randomly to an intervention or control group. So we'll talk briefly about these trials, these uh, type of studies. So next we talk about the study design. Uh, so there are certain questions we should ask if you want to uh, discover the design of study. Uh, first of all, what was the aim of the study? So whenever we look at the study, we should uh, see what is the aim of the study and uh, to simply, if there a study is just to sim describe a population, it's called a descriptive study. And on the other hand, if uh, a study which is quantifying the relationship between factors, is called analytic study. Now, second question then we, sh we should ask, if an analytic study was the intervention randomly allocated. So we should look for randomization if, if that study involved randomization. If it does not, then it's an observational study. Now for observational study, the main types will then depend on the timing of the measurement of outcome. So our third question would naturally be, when were the outcomes determined? So uh, there are three types sometime after the exposure or intervention, after the treatment. So that's called cohort study. And we also actually commonly call it prospective study. At the same time as the, if the outcome was determined at the same time as the exposure or intervention, it's called cross-sectional study, or uh, simply, for example, surveys that we do. The third type, uh, if the outcome was determined before the exposure, so this is a case control study, and we do a lot of retrospective study, which is an example of case control study. So let me talk further about case control study. So case control, we have two groups. So we compare cases with controls. So in cases, uh, we put patients who have the disease or outcome of interest. Interest means that the outcome that we are interested in. And control, uh, we put patients who do not have the disease or outcome. So those are just probably healthy patients or they don't have that uh, disease that we are actually studying. So we compare these two groups. Uh, the case control study actually looks back retrospectively to compare how frequently the exposure to a risk factor is present, is present in each group to determine the relationship between the risk factor and the disease. Case control study also uh, observational because no intervention is attempted and no attempt is made to alter the course of the disease. So the case control studies, we are comparing case and control, they are observational, and there is no intervention done. Example of such a, uh, such a study is uh, changes in retinal thickness. If somebody wants to 
see for changes in retinal thickness on OCT after intravitreal lucentis injection in patient with DME. So this would be a case control study. We can compare it with, with uh, patients who do not have, uh, who do not have AMD or DME, sorry. Now, there are some uh, benefits and some uh, disadvantage of uh, case control studies. So the pros are, uh, uh, case control studies are good for studying rare conditions or diseases. They involve less time needed to conduct the study because the condition or disease has already occurred. So we don't actually have to wait uh, for, the, for the condition to develop. Uh, the third is a uh, case control study lets you simultaneously look, simultaneously look at multiple risk factors. And the last point is uh, useful, case control studies are useful as initial studies to establish an association. On the other hand, the, the disadvantage of case control studies are they are retrospective studies and they have more problems with data quality because they rely on memory. So people, uh, you have to, I mean, uh, look back and dig information from the record. Uh, they're not good for evaluating diagnostic tests because it's already clear that the cases have the condition and the controls do not. So uh, this is one of the dis disadvantage of cases, case control study. And the last one is it can be difficult to find a suitable control group. So you, can, uh, you have to compare it with a control and, and it would be difficult in some conditions that you may not find the control group. Another type of study that you may come across is cohort studies. So cohort are also called longitudinal studies. These are case-defined population who, who presently have a certain exposure or they may have received a particular treatment that are followed over time. And that is then compared with another group who are not affected by the exposure uh, under investigation. So the cohort studies are used to establish causation of a disease or to evaluate the outcome impact of treatment when randomized control trials are not possible. So example of such cohort study is uh, to see the effect of Avastin on visual acuity in patients suffering with wet AMD. So we are actually, uh, in this example, we would look at a particular uh, diagnosis and this would be a population who's suffering with, with this condition. So this would be a cohort study. So uh, cohort study can be prospective and, and retrospective. Prospective is when the exposure factors are identified at the beginning of the study and defined population is followed into the future. So that's also a cohort study and it's, it's done in a prospective manner. Now we can also do it in retrospective uh, by looking at the past medical records for the defined population and are used to identify exposure factors. Now the advantage and disadvantage of the case co uh, co uh, cohort study. Uh, the advantage are subjects in cohort can be matched, which limits the influence of confounding variables. Okay. And it can be standardized. Uh, there can be standardization of criteria outcome, which is possible. They are easier and cheaper than randomized control trials. And the disadvantage of cohort study is that cohorts can be difficult to identify due to confounding variables. Uh, there is no randomization involved, which means that the imbalances in patient characteristics could exist. Uh, blinding or masking is difficult. We will, uh, I will tell you about blinding and masking later. Uh, and the last one is outcome of interest could take time to occur. So the randomized control trial is another uh, type of study design which you may see uh, while you do research. So there are two groups in this. We have one treatment group and the other one is control group. Uh, treatment group receives the investigational treatment or whatever the treatment which we are using uh, in that group. Uh, and the other one is control group which receive either placebo or standard treatment. So placebo is just, uh, it's not a treatment, but it, it looks like treatment. So in the randomized control trial, patients are randomly assigned to all groups and the randomized control trials are considered the gold standard in the medical research because we, we get rid of most of the bias of uh, which patient to go in which group. So it's done uh, uh, randomized, uh, it's done through a software and there are certain uh, uh, companies, there are certain uh, vendors which are available which, which do it for, for bigger randomized control trials. So the advantage and disadvantage of randomized control trial, uh, the advantages are that the good randomization will wash out any population bias. 
So the population bias could be if you don't have a bigger sample size, if you don't have too many patients, uh, but if you use a randomized trial, uh, ra if you use randomization, then it will still produce good results of your study. Uh, randomized control trials are easier to blind or mask than observational studies. Uh, results can be analyzed with well-known statistical tools, and the population of participating individuals are clearly identified. The disadvantages of randomized control trial are there because they are expensive, and the reason for expensiveness is that uh, there are certain uh, vendors, there are certain companies which are involved who do the randomization for us, and but they, there's also a fee for that. So they charge, you have to pay for it. Yeah, for bigger multi-center trials, uh, those vendors actually are hired, and that's where the study becomes expensive. There are volunteer biases. The, the population that participates may not be representative of the whole population. Uh, because of randomization, so that's one disadvantage. Uh, it does not reveal causation. Uh, that's also a disadvantage, and the last one is loss to follow-up attributed to treatment. So this last point is important because uh, if you have uh, two, two kind of treatment, let's say one, one placebo and one treatment, and the patient who received placebo uh, does not see any improvement in vision or his symptoms, he may not, he may not come back to the study. So you will lose the patient after two or three visits. Now this is another design of study which is it's called crossover study. Uh, in this there are two type of treatments, uh, treatment A and treatment B, and we have two patients, patient one, patient two. So in this type of design, uh, study design, patient one first receives treatment A, and patient two receives treatment, treatment B. It can be done at the same time, and then over, over after some times, so after some period, let's say three months or six months as designed by the study, patient one receives treatment B and patient two receives treatment A. So there is a crossover uh, of treatment uh, between the two patients. It doesn't have to have two patients, it can have whatever patient, whatever sample size, but this is just the basics of the, uh, uh, simply the design of the study. So it crosses over. So both the patient will receive both the treatments. Uh, the example of such a, such a study is the uh, RISE and RIDE study, which is the long-term outcome of uh, Lucentis therapy for diabetic medical edema. Uh, this study, uh, so in this study, they used, uh, they used Lucentis and, uh, on patient and the other group was uh, observational. Uh, they did not receive anything, but there was a rescue laser involved in that study. So that was a crossover study. Now, the advantage and disadvantage of crossover study, the advantages are all subjects subjects serve as own control and error, so that's, that's one advantage. So all subjects will receive whatever two treatments are, if one is better than the other, but they will, they will still give you the, the important ad, uh, information. So both the, all the patients will provide you uh, information about the treatment A and treatment B. Variance is reduced, thus reducing sample size needed. So uh, for, for crossover study, you don't need a bigger sample size because you're, you're using two type of uh, treatment and you're using both the treatment on all the patients. So you don't need a bigger sample size. Another one, all subjects, they receive treatment. Uh, if there is no placebo, so all the, all the patients, they will receive treatment. And blinding can be maintained because you, the treatment would look same, uh, so uh, it can be maintained. Uh, the disadvantage are all subjects receive placebo or alternative treatment at some point. So again, there is a, there's a chance of patient losing to follow up. Washout period is lengthy or unknown. So if a patient, uh, if patient receives an investigational drug and the second treatment is a standard treatment, uh, so the, the washout for the investigational treatment is, is longer. So they have to wait until, uh, they have to wait if the patient wants to go to another study cannot be used for treatment with permanent effects. So uh, the crossover study can only be used for, uh, for trials which do not give uh, permanent effects, which uh, the symptoms are usually reversible. Now, another term that we use is a double blind study. So blinding is actually used, it doesn't mean that the patient is blind, it's not done on blind patient. It's just a term that we use for, uh, for masking. And also masking does not mean that you have to wear a mask because one of the doctors just told me an example that, uh, that a nurse offered him to wear mask because he said that I'm masked to the treatment. So mask does not mean that he needs to wear a mask. 
so blind it means that you mask certain uh, team member of your research of the study not to know the treatment so that there would not be any bias involved in the uh, in the study or involved in you know the way they they treat the patient uh, they look at the patient all that uh, so doctor, staff, and patient, they do not know that what treatment patient is receiving. This is a double blind. So nobody knows in the, in the research team that uh, what the treatment is. And it's usually done in the randomized control trial. Now the PILS studies are easy to double blind because uh, in those studies where patient is taking two kind of similar pills, so they don't know what, what kind of uh, pill they are taking. They are, they are of similar color, similar size, and similar timing. Uh, so it's easy and the, the, the nurse or the research coordinator or the researcher who's admi administrating that, uh, that treatment would not know and even the doctor would not know. Uh, what so the pill studies are easy to double blind. As compared to the injection studies, like we, we are doing uh, one trial with the uh, Vastin, it's difficult to double blind uh, that study because we know whether the patient will receive injection or he will re receive a sham. Sham is just we pretend that uh, patient is receiving a treatment. Patient may, may think that he did receive an injection, but uh, we know that that was a sham. The doctor who was doing the injection would know we, uh, that this was a sham, this was not the real treatment. So it's difficult to double blind uh, s study which, is, uh, which, is, which involves injection. So a double blind study is most rigorous clinical research design because in addition to the randomization of subject which reduces the risk of bias, it can eliminate or minimize the placebo effect which is further which is a further challenge to the validity of study. Excuse me. So another term that uh, you may hear about meta-analyses. Uh, so meta-analysis is a, is a meta-analysis is a systematic objective way to combine data from many studies, usually from randomized controlled trials, and arrive at a pooled estimate of treatment effectiveness and statistical significance. Uh, so what, uh, what researchers do actually, uh, if they want to, let's say for example, they want to look for anti therapy for AMD or, or for DME, and they want to design a study. So they want to see what has been done so far, what treatments are available for, uh, what anti treatment are available for DME or AMD. So they would go back, they would search literature for past 40 years, 60 years, and um, they will select some studies which will fit the criteria or fit their hypothesis, and they will analyze the results, and then they, will, uh, they would actually uh, publish that as a meta-analysis paper. So that's called meta-analysis. The advantage and disadvantage of meta-analysis is that by merging data, it increases power by increasing sample size and allows for analyses that would not otherwise be possible. So uh, everybody uh, know who does research that a bigger sample size actually is, is a, um, a will give you power to your study, will give you power to your results. Um, so meta-analysis, you actually increase the sample size, uh, you enroll 800 patients, and it, it's all done retrospectively. So that actually will increase uh, your power. Uh, secondly, resolve uncertainty when a conflicting results occur. So if there are conflicting results, if you have a bigger sample size in a meta-analysis, uh, you can get rid of the conflicts. Uh, it improves the generalizability of findings. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so the, the findings which are uh, obtained from the meta-analysis can be generalized and, uh, over, over the same condition that you're actually studying in your study. The disadvantage is that publication bias or studies which show no effect or little effect are often not published and just filed away. So met th this is a disadvantage of doing a meta-analysis that it may not be published. Uh, and it, it totally depends upon the journal. Uh, and the last point for the disadvantage, the quality of the design of studies from which data is pulled can lead to misleading results when all the data on the subject from published literature are summarized. Any questions? All right. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today I will talk about our research and ethics and uh, GCash. So, firstly, it's very important to understand uh, the most important uh, terms in ethics and research. Uh, the first one is uh, who are human subjects? 
uh, uh, living individuals about uh, whom an investigator obtains for research. The first option is the date uh, through intervention or interaction with the individual or uh, identifiable uh, private uh, information. But what is the definition of clinical research? It's uh, the systematic collection of data designed to contribute uh, to general tribal knowledge, for example, investigated causes of uh, disease. Any experiment that involves a test article and one or more human subjects must be submitted to the Saudi FDA. Uh, for example, when you want to test a new drug, it's very important to inform and to get uh, the approval of the Saudi FDA. And what is not a clinical research? For example, clinical practice activities in the hospital is not clinical research. Uh, quality assurance activities, uh, for example, to uh, audit uh, of the GCAA, uh, specimens and information from the citizen person is basic research, sample of uh, bank A's, corneas, uh, and other tissues. They identified the specimens from a tissue bank uh, is a basic research, it's a uh, clinical research. And the last one is anonymous uh, surveys and interviews to subjects, uh, patients, or members of uh, this uh, hospital. Who is the responsible in clinical research? We are two different uh, actors, the principal investigator and the RB. The principal investigator and research team have uh, the responsibility to understand the policies and procedures and comply with them. Another part of the RIP and institutions, uh, for example, the Saudi FDA, uh, have the responsibility to comply, uh, comply uh, with the Saudi laws of the Saudi FDA and the Sharia law and the international regulation. It's important. Who is in the middle? In the middle of uh, this situation, what which uh, we have uh, different actors like RB institution, investigator, uh, the big pharmaceutical companies or the society of the government is the subject, the passion. So the most important is the subject, the passion. So where, what is uh, RB? is any board or other group formally designated by an institution to review research involving human subjects. So then any RB uh, can be in a hospital, in universities, in uh, ministries, right, that uh, is necessary to register in the Ministry of Health in Saudi Arabia. The primary objective is to assure the protection of the rights and welfare of the human subject, and the most important objective. The RB must determine it, risks to participate are minimized, risks that are reasonable in relation to anticipated benefits and the importance of the knowledge that is expected to result. Selection of the participant, is in case of the children or prisoner, uh, is, uh, there are special uh, rules. Informed consent will be uh, obtained from participant or their legally authorized representatives in case of uh, children, for example. And uh, the confidentiality is uh, the quality maintained. So uh, the RRB can approve, approve good required or modification, minor or major uh, modifications, or disapprove your application. Where is the responsibilities of the principal investigator? Um, the human side of protection is more than creating an informed consent form. It's a process. When the principal investigator give the informed consent of, 
concern for to the patient is not only in the paper. It's a process. What it means? I say that it's important to explain the prior to the patient. And if the patient cannot understand, you should explain to the other way. More resp responsibilities of the principal investigator is to train and manage the study team, the clinical research, um, the co-investigators, the technicians in the laboratory, all members participating in, in the research project. Treat each research participant with respect. Report adverse events in a timely manner. Ask for help if you have a question, always, to the RB manager or the director of the research. The most common mistakes uh, which I have found during this uh, stage in KICAS uh, were admi administrative issues like uh, the application form. There are no signatory in the application form or sometimes the principal investigator decide to mark the box exclusion of pregnant women. But when you read the clinical protocol, it's not detailed the exclusion criteria with a pregnant woman. So sometimes there is a contradiction between both document. The informed consent form. The informed consent form is a very important document. It's not only two pages. It's, uh, it's the right of the passion. So then it's very important to explain, to write uh, the informing consent form using a regular, normal language, no medical language. All right. The trick is to think in your mother. If your mother can understand the informing consent form, you wrote well. Uh, selection of subject, uh, how the principal investigator uh, will enroll the subject. Um, it's uh, it's uh, a, a very important point. Collaborative project, of course, to get an uh, agreement between KICAS and other institutions, uh, Job Hawkins University or Kinsale University, anyway. Data collection sheet, Nasura, uh, our best edition. It's very important to discuss, discuss with Nasira uh, the data collection sheet because when the principal investigator uh, finishes the, the project and the, uh, they want to analyze the data, Nasira has a lot of problems and sometimes it's not possible to analyze. So then please, before to submit uh, any project, consult with Nasira. Types of review. We are three, accept, expedited, and full review. The first one, accept review, is when the research does not utilize human subject. So then, uh, for example, when uh, there are certain involving the in collection or study of data and documents from public search, pathological or diagnostic specimens, and is it cannot be uh, identified. It's very important. The research involving the use of educational tests, anonymous surveys or interviews are not uh, necessarily passed through the full uh, review, oh, is accept. The expedited review, the research must present no more than minimal risks to subjects. What is the, what means minimal risks? Is the probability and magnitude of this conform in the research are not greater than those ordinarily incoordinated in daily life or during the performance of routine examination of tests, the regular practice in KCAS. 
So then several uh, ex, uh, example of expedited review, the studies of approved drugs, devices for marketing, collection of uh, specimens, tear, saliva, by non-invasive methods, collection of data through non-invasive uh, procedures routinely employed in clinical practice, for example, electroretinography, the study of data, documents, records, pathological and diagnostic specimens, and research involving surveys, interviews, etc. This is a summary of our um, process inside the RB office. And the criteria for getting the RB approval is a summary. The risks to subjects are minimized. Risks that are uh, reasonable in relation to benefits. Selection of subject, I mentioned in the last uh, slides. Informed consent form is documented. Data collection is monitored to ensure subject safety, privacy and confidentiality, and additional safeguards and are clear for vulnerable population, like uh, children or prisoners. The informed consent form, uh, the basic elements are the explication of the research, the proposed expected duration, description of uh, procedures. Um, the principal investigator uh, has to explain in detail these points. Resinimal risks or disconform to the subject, benefits, alternatives to participate or not in the project, uh, the confidentiality about uh, identification of the patient, compensation in case of clinical trials, person of contact, usually is uh, a duramen, and participation is voluntary, it's not mandatory. So who may obtain consent for a potential research subject? The principal investigator, the co-investigator listed in the application form, or the consent designated. In this case, only if uh, the principal investigator uh, trained to the uh, consent designated and approved by the RIB. So <clears throat> when the RIB uh, committee decide to approve or not uh, your project, we have uh, three different options. Full approval, approval with revisions, minor or major, and this approval or reject. Full approval, when uh, this decision is made, no changes are required in the submission, so then the protocol has been fully approved and the research ca activities can begin when the principal investigator decide. Approval with uh, minor revisions are required, for example, clarification, minor grammatical changes, uh, rewarding or reorganization of the content, the RB has approved the research pad and also made recommendation improvements to the research plan, for example. Once the applicant has changed the submitted protocol following the recommendations to the RB, he she may request a review to the RB manager in my case for getting uh, the final approval of the RB chair. But in case of uh, major revision, uh, uh, the RB committee will explain the reasons to decide to approve with the major revisions. The applicant, uh, the principal investigator, must provide a corrected red submission to the RB manager. Upon the subsequent uh, for review in the next RB committee meeting, the application uh, may be granted to any of the four possible pos dispositions, full, uh, uh, 
approval with a major revisions, minor revisions, or rejected. So then the proposed research may not begin until full approval has been granted to by the RB com committee. The last one is the disapproval or reject. The RB committee will explain the reasons for disapproval. Sometimes the protocol lacks uh, scientific merit, has multiple problems, uh, and the applicant must submit a new application. <coughs> Thank you, and uh, remember, the rights and welfare of the patient is the most important. So there's no reporting mechanism within the hospital to the director of research or the general executive director or medical director. It reports directly to the National Bioethics Council, and they, they, they report, and we submit an annual report of all the projects that are done here and IRB decisions to the National Bioethics Council once a year. Any other questions from the audience? No? I guess everything is understood. I'd like to thank all the speakers for uh, their talks, and we hope to see you next week for the next round of research talks. Thank you very much. <laughs>